What's up, guys? We're back with a brand new video. In this video, we're going to be teaching you about DATS. That is what this video is going to be about. Now, I'm going to tell you DATS V2, which is what I'm going to teach you on, although DATS V3 is the exact same thing. We got a lot of people asking about this video. Uh, mainly my patrons asked for this video. They said, hey, we just got DATS V3. Can you teach it? Guys, most people think that this is just for speaker builders. It's not. This is good for uh, people that review speakers. And also, someone that wants to repair speakers this is also really good for it as well. Now, when you open it, this is what you're going to see. So whether you have DATS V2 or DATS V3, this is the exact same program that you're going to see here on the screen. You're going to see this big black screen, and then you're going to see some things on the left and on the right. Once that is done, you have a couple options. First option you see here is impedance sweep. This is probably where most people are going to use this, whether you're testing speakers or like for YouTube or doing like a review on them or whether you're trying to repair speakers or build them, this is going to be the main feature of this program. All you have to do is hook up your positive and negative leads to the driver or the speaker. So this can be hooked up to a speaker that's already been built or just an individual driver that you're going to be using to build a speaker. Now that I've said that, I, I need to throw a big warning up there, okay? Do not have your speaker, driver, whatever you're testing, hooked up to an amplifier at the time. Don't have it hooked up to anything for that matter, but definitely not an amplifier. If you have it hooked up to an amplifier, then you hook up DATS to it, you're going to have a very, very bad day. So don't do that. Now what you're going to do is you're just going to press this impedance sweep once it's hooked up, and this is what you're going to see. Okay, now this is just a normal driver. It's going to give you your impedance. Now, if for whatever reason this is like a 4-ohm driver and you need to see it or a 2-ohm driver or something of that nature, you can change the view right over here on the left-hand side up at the very top. Just change that to be able to get within the specs that you want to be able to view this impedance graph as. Now, if you're a speaker builder like me, then you're going to want to save this. So you're going to jump up to the file and you're going to export that data as a... ZMA file and then that will open up in programs like XM and passive crossover designer or whatever you use to design your crossover really important thing to do now if you're testing speakers that's where this really comes in handy especially like if you're reviewing speakers uh, you can go ahead and do this impedance sweep like we're doing right here and it'll give the people an idea of what this speaker would be good for like if it has a really high rising impedance up towards the high end then it's probably not going to be good for a tube amp, but it would be fantastic for, you know, class D, class A, B amp without without a tube preamp or anything hooked up to it. If it has a nice even one, you can tell people, hey, this would be good for a tube amp or pretty much any speaker, I'm sorry, any amplifier that you'd want to drive it with. Uh, you'll also be able to see if there's any problem areas in the impedance. So if there's anything that drops way below the nominal impedance of the driver, you can tell someone, you're going to need an, an amplifier that will at least push 4 ohms or 2 ohms or whatever you need it to, to push based off the impedance curve. So that data can become really in handy. Now another thing you can do is if you hook up a speaker that's already been built like a ported speaker, we'll go ahead and do an impedance sweep on this. You can also get a lot of information off of this. And when you see this data, there's a couple things that you can get. The first, where these two peaks, where they dip, the, the lowest dip is where that speaker is tuned to or where it's ported to. That's really important information to be able to tell people when you're reviewing speakers, and it's also a good way to keep manufacturers honest. So if a manufacturer said, hey, we port tune this to 20 hertz, and you're reading 35 hertz there, well, there's a problem there. Now, if you're reading 22 hertz, and it's like a 1 or 2 hertz discrepancy, don't worry about that. That's not a big deal. But if it's a wide gap there, then you, know, you might want to mention that. Now, if that's all that's did, that would already be really good. But you can also check your TS specs here. Now, this is a way for you to check if you're building speakers. So we'll, we'll go off on a version for those who are going to build speakers, and we're going to come back to something for people repairing speakers. Now, we can get the TS specs as well, which is what you need to build a box. So if you're a big recycler of parts or uh, you bought a bunch of buyout stuff that has no TS specs on it, the manufacturer didn't provide any, or you don't trust the manufacturer data, then this is a really good place to get those TS specs. You just get the driver out, you run your uh, free air measurements, and then you're going to need to find your VAS. Now, there's two common ways to do that. One is to build an enclosure the exact size that you know. So, for example, one cubic foot. 
then you would just put that data in this box right here and you'd find your VAS. Most people don't know that. So for those, I just tell you to go get a little kitchen scale or something else where you can measure the weight of something. Now you can use an inductor, you can use a roll of tape, you can use anything you want. It doesn't matter as long as it's big enough. If it's not heavy enough, that's what will tell you and it'll give you a warning and, and then you'll have to rerun it with something heavier. So you're just gonna put that in the middle of your speaker and then you're gonna run DATS again. Uh, you're gonna run the VAS at least this time. And when you do, it's gonna give you all the data that you need. Now, one thing that you're gonna notice is it does talk about the effective piston diameter. I do wanna talk about this for a minute because I think a lot of people get confused on this. The effective piston diameter is data that you have to input. Now, most people, when they see like an eight inch sub, they're thinking, well, it's an eight inch sub, therefore I'm gonna put eight inches in there. That's not how that works. The effective piston diameter in this case is the center of the surround to the center of the surround, okay? So an eight inch sub is typically closer to seven inches. Now you're just gonna to wanna to measure that with a tape measure, ruler, whatever you want, and just put that data in there before you try to get your TS specs. Otherwise, you might be a little bit off. All right, now here comes some really cool things. This is, I mean, if you're repairing electronics in general, this is a really cool thing to do. And there's these three buttons on the side that say resistor, inductor, and capacitor. These will actually allow you to test each individual component before you put it in your crossover network. Now, that's really, really good for a couple reasons. First, like if you're repairing speakers and you have a crossover that's good, and a crossover that's bad, and you want this open up a speaker that's been sitting for a while or, or is out, you'll know that it is almost impossible typically to read the values on any of those components anymore. So you have to measure them. That's what this does. It allows you to measure the capacitor, the resistor, or the inductor, and give you all the data. It also gives you your DCR on your inductor. Now that's really important because when we do crossover design, we want to know that DCR. Or if you're replacing it, you want to replace it with something with like DCR. Now I actually measured this inductor right here. This was supposed to be an inductor that was 0.7 and have a DCR around 0.6. Okay, this is way off. And that's important to know because if I was putting this in my crossover network and I was expecting it to react correctly, it's, it's not going to react the way that I wanted it to. So I might try a different inductor than this particular one. Now, another thing that you can do is if you really, really want to perfectly match these components, you can keep looking for components until they get within the tolerance that you're okay with. So you can keep testing inductors if you have 10 of them and find the two that are closest to spec so that that way you can use those two on the pair of speakers. And that will allow you to have a lot more consistency when you're building these speakers and give you a lot better quality product when you're done. All right, now the last major feature that I use in this program is called the Rub and Buzz. Now the Rub and Buzz is very good as it allows you to test individual drivers to make sure that they are good or bad before you use them in a project or if you're repairing a speaker. Now, in order to use this feature, you do have to have one known good driver. Once you have that good driver, you just hook it up to DATS and run the rub and buzz test. Now, all you have to do is hook up all the drivers. Now, you just individually test each. Now, you just need to test each of the same make and model driver and keep testing it, and you'll keep getting a pass or fail. If it has passed, that means the driver is good, and if it has failed, that means the driver is bad. As you can see, this would be very important for someone that is repairing speakers as they can easily test the drivers and narrow down what the problem area might be. Now, these are the main features of DATS. There are other features in DATS that you can go around and explore, but these really are the ones that I use the majority of the time. And honestly, there's not much more that I, I really use this program for. Now, if there's something that you feel like I missed and you think, hey, you know, you should have gone over this, put it in the comment section, guys. I definitely value that comment section for you guys to be able to share that information. You can also share it on the website, toidsdiyaudio.com. Just go there. There will be a link in the description, as always. Go ahead and sign up for the forum and, and share what you've learned, what you've done, Love to see projects over there, guys. It's just a great community for you to be able to learn and grow uh, more about speaker building or, of course, more about DIY audio in general or just go there to hang out with some people that really like to do the same things you do. 
All right, guys, if you have any questions, any comments, any concerns, any abusive language, nah, actually, leave that off. <laughs> but everything else, leave in the comment section. I do try to check those out. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. As always, it's 123 Toyd, and I'm out.